Why was some of the 2021 weather events that happened so deadly? We are going to be covering, um... We are going to be covering, um... Four of these such events. We will be covering, um... The giant winter storm that knocked out the power in Texas in February. We will be talking about the, um... The insane Pacific Northwest heat wave, the insane flash floods across the New York metropolitan area in early September, and probably touch on the rest of Ida in the process, as well as a tornado outbreak from December. Why were these four weather events so deadly? And honestly, why haven't we had a repeat of any of that into 2022? Because we really didn't. Well... As far as the first tragic event goes, Winter Storm already caused approximately 300 people to die, mostly in the Texas power crisis. At least 210 people die, but estimates go up to 702. Unconfirmed estimates state that anywhere between half a thousand to nearly a thousand people could have died in the Winter Storm in Texas, but they weren't officially confirmed. The Winter Storm began as most others, um, but it actually caused a third of Portland to lose power. And that briefly made the headlines because it was an abnormal amount of snow for them. The storm then moved south and caused fatalities in New Mexico, as well as a lot of snow. Then around February 15th, it's made its way to Texas. This was a cloudy and raw day here with temperatures stuck in the 30s. But out in Texas, they were dealing with blizzard-like conditions. Cold came, temperatures went down to negative 2 degrees Fahrenheit in Dallas and around 11 degrees in Houston. High temperatures this day failed to escape freezing in many locations, and the power lines were not winterized. Because Texas, unlike Oklahoma, could not import energy from other powers, Oklahoma saw 13 deaths, by the way, the power lines froze and they stayed frozen. They were minutes away from having a complete catastrophic failure that would have caused trillions of dollars in damage. But a lot of the damage was already done. At least about $200 billion in damage, with some people saying it was nearly $300 billion in damage. And this storm didn't even dump that much snow there. Only a couple inches, but it was a full-on cold in an area that is not used to this. And in an area that cannot import energy from other people... That led to power lines bursting and people having to boil their own water. So what lessons can be learned from this? Well, a lesson that we can learn from this is, um, is that... We need to, um... Not be so self-serving with our energy. Texas was on their own thing to avoid um, winterize, to avoid, not winter, to avoid U.S. power fees. Had they had abided by the policies, they could have imported energy. Only the northern and westernmost fringes of Texas had the ability to do so because they weren't on a Texas power grid. Most of Texas was screwed if the power line had a cascade failure, which it did. The winter storm made its way over to the northeast by February 17th into the 18th, leading to a day here that was snowy and stuck in the 20s. I believe this was the last day that it failed to get about freezing, which is a typical last date for this occurrence. And, um, and overall, not too much damage up here, especially when compared to the wreck that occurred in Texas. What about the Pacific Northwest heat wave? Well, another lesson that we can learn is that unpreparedness is going to cause events that otherwise shouldn't be tragic headlines to become tragic headlines. This heat wave was in the U.S. and Canada, and between the two, at least 800 people were confirmed to have died, with over 1,400 in unconfirmed reports. Damage was at least $8.9 billion. Power outages weren't too insane here, but you have to realize that, he, is that only a third of the area about has AC because typically in the summer, it only gets into the mid to upper seventies. This saw all time heat records be broken. As a matter of fact, this was in late June. Seattle had, a, had their warmest night on record with a high of 73 degrees, 
which is warmer than their average high for this time of year. The high temperature, I believe the day before, was 108 degrees. On June 29th, an all-time record was set for the highest temperature above 50 degrees north when Laton in British Columbia hit 121 degrees. That is 49 degrees Celsius and absolutely insane. The low was 69 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius, which is still well above normal. The next day, with a low of 25 degrees Celsius, 77 degrees Fahrenheit, and high still, and high still around the 40 degrees Celsius, 104 degrees Fahrenheit mark, a fast-moving wildfire destroyed the area, causing two deaths and 150 million dollars in damage. That I believe was added onto the heat wave total, given how this was pretty much directly fueled by the heat wave. But Washington and Oregon were not spared. While British Columbia saw 569 confirmed deaths, there was also one in Idaho and 112 in Oregon and 116 in Washington. Maybe I'll make a live stream and cover these events in greater detail. Or maybe I'll wait till the next event because no matter whether or not I whether that's boring. But in, um, in this event, what essentially happened was, was that um, the heat dome was trapped, leading to triple digit temperatures in areas where there should be none. The Northwest is actually next in line for a bracing of heat. So I'm going to make a short showing you the um, temperatures at a certain time in the afternoon and how disturbingly high they are. I'll also show you the heat index, even though the humidity during this heat wave is not all that strong. But the fact, honestly, that there even was a heat index should be a sign. Basically, this heat wave was a heat zone that was trapped, and because of unpreparedness, as well as the effects of climate change, allowed it to get as bad as it did, which really made it um, unbearable and caused fatalities. The extreme heat then migrated its way over east, um, causing heat records in Montana, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and eventually over in eastern Quebec as well. But nothing is bad as it happens in the Pacific Northwest. Next up is Ida. Now, Louisiana saw $55 billion in damage and um, 30 five-ish deaths, which is not that bad for a Category 4 hurricane it's, that goes directly over your major city. Ground level wind speeds were still at Category 3 status at 111 miles an hour and sustained themselves at 75 miles an hour for the entire day. This maintained Category 4 status for quite a while inland. New Orleans saw a peak wind of 90 miles an hour and as a matter of fact, the entire city lost power. But this is not a trophic power cascade thing, even though the heat as a, as a, as the temperatures get to 90, feel like 100, persisted around for so long. With nights barely, with nights failing to cool out of the 80s, it, was, it wasn't that. Even though 21 people did die because of that. There also four deaths in Mississippi and two deaths in Alabama. But then by August 31st, Ida appeared to be a dying storm. The Northeast, while expected to get saved was not supposed to be in this but on december 1st all of that manages to change what happens is is that what happens is is that um ida regains strength over virginia there's a high risk for flash flooding rainfall totals are estimated between three and eight inches there is a risk of flash flooding, but at this point, it's too late to evacuate, and most people simply go on business as normal, thinking that it's not going to impact them. The worst of it can't be directly over the city, which it kind of was. Hoboken was heavily damaged. New York City also saw heavy damage. There were, there were 48 deaths between New York and New Jersey alone, and about 17-ish billion dollars in damage between the two places. Billions of dollars in damage 
and heavy fatalities we've seen in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, with New York seeing 18 deaths, New Jersey seeing 30, and Pennsylvania seeing five. That one was around three billion in Pennsylvania, around eight billion in New York, and about nine billion in New Jersey. This is because the humidity was able to surge, this temperature surge into the mid 70s after being in the 60s just a few hours before. And there was a fatal tornado that touched down in Pennsylvania, an EF2 in Upper Dublin Township that caused the first tornado related fatality since April. That's right, May, June, July, and August, despite some months having heavy outbreaks, did not see a single tornado related fatality. Which led to 2022 ones total being well below normal, and it will not surge up into above normal territory until literally the last three weeks of the year. Or well, three weeks in a day. And we'll be talking about that event at the end because honestly, that event is quite disturbing. But basically, over the Northeast in total, because there was a death in Connecticut, two in Maryland, and one in Virginia. There were 57 deaths across the entire region or so, and about $20 billion in damage. On September 2nd, the air felt more refreshing. Temperatures managed to dip down to the um, 60s with high gains the upper 70s and low humidity, which some called an immaculate weather day that um, was well needed after one of the worst weather days in history, as the city was literally underwater with... Um, Three inches of rain, over three inches of rain falling in a single hour, the second wettest hour on record. The um, total amount of rain was around seven inches, with more being recorded west of the city. Um, anyway, the. Um, Anyway, the final event to talk about, um, oh, by the way, lessons learned is that when you see that kind of a forecast, you need to take action to it. These meteorologists are not wrong. That's a good lesson. Anyway, for the 20th, we're going to summer 10th to 11th. The outbreak of this, the, the lesson of this, there isn't really one. This is more so the meteorologist's fault. This outbreak was not well predicted, and even though there was a moderate risk of severe weather, that usually translates to busts. This should have been a high risk of severe weather. This, um, the area that was sensitive around was also wrong, and it was mainly because of a single fatal tornado why this event became so bad. There were 89 direct tornadoes, that's plus six non-tornado act deaths, including three indirect tornado fatalities, for a total of 95 deaths in the system, down to just $3.9 billion. Despite the Western Kentucky tornado not having an official price tag, all we know is that it cost $25,000 as an EF0 in Tennessee, maybe an EF1. The tornado likely caused extreme damage, it just wasn't published. The tornado went through Mayfield and other Western Kentucky towns for three hours, causing absolute havoc, including 57 deaths plus one in direct and 515 injuries. This was the deadliest single tornado on record since May 2011, and 23 people died in Mayfield alone. There was also another EF3 that caused 16 deaths plus one indirect and 63 injuries in Bowling Green, Kentucky, mainly because it went almost directly through downtown. This was at night where people were sleeping and weren't ready to hear the, the rampant tornado emergencies that were going out which is partly why the death and injury toll was so abnormally high. This is a single wave of storms that was um, mostly done and over quickly, but this is a situation where the damage had already been done, even as the storms marched east and were not as bad as expected in the area, with record highs being set in many locations as the storm attempted to make its wake.